come in, please. Everyone who's outside is out of the I welcome you on behalf of the Legends of India. The Legends of India uh, was established in 1998 uh, with the aim to promote Indian culture and art music and build knowledge around it. The Pendulum Sun dialogue series is knowledge art. And uh, Shanta said recently has very kindly consented to curate these images for us. Uh, she's, I mean, she needs no instruct in production. She's the vice chairperson of the Sangeet Nadak Academy and chairperson of the Asia Pacific Performing Arts Network. We uh, highly request Shanta Ji to. subject for this evening is about cultural identity, local versus global issues of cultural identity and it's, uh, it's also a very opportune time to have this discussion because the recent elections were uh, quite significantly impacted by the issues of cultural identity and I, I, there are erudite people who deep delve into that, let me not do that. Uh, so let me start introducing the panelists for this evening. Uh, May I invite Dr. Ambit Srinivasan? <coughs> uh, she has done some very pioneering work uh, in on Devdasis, which is still very seminal in various forms of, uh, uh, across many disciplines. She is a, a member of the National Integration Council to represent women's issues. She is, um, she has also been the Vice Chairman of Humanities and Social Sciences at the Department of East Asian Studies at Tel Aviv University uh, and, uh, and also uh, been lecturing in various parts of the world including the Cambridge University and the Macquarie University in Canada. Welcome to Dr. Amitriyos. Our next speaker this evening is Ambassador Vladimir Singh. Uh, I mean, he needs no introduction really. He's been uh, He's been the, in the IFS and being the Secretary for Foreign Affairs. He's been ambassador in Nigeria, United Emirates, having charges of many charge in the camera rooms. He's been the deputy chef of mission at uh, Washington. And he's been one of the Foreign Services Institute. He uh, uh, continues to be a lecturer at the postgraduate uh, Department of Political Science. And his last, uh, his last, yeah, uh, Dr. Mansing retired as the Foreign Secretary, and his last posting was as the Ambassador of the United States of America. Let me uh, invite Dr. Uh, Mr. Johar Sarkar from the Indian Administrative Services, currently the CEO of Prasad Bharti, overseeing uh, AIR and Doordarshan. Uh, Mr. Johar Sarkar is a man of many parts. He's the only person I know who's uh, straddled the words of finance, commerce, and industries, plus uh, been very active in public communications, education, culture, and media, and related finance. Uh, this can be short of the introduction, but uh, as you know, I mean, these are not people who need introductions. Uh, Shantaji, may I request you to take the word? Thank you, Ed. Marks. Uh, principally, we have an excellent and dynamic set of speakers here who should enlighten us a lot on a very burning topic because I think among the principal concerns of globalization and the way it is sweeping across the world is of course uh, how it is impacting our age-old quote-unquote holy culture and how uh, it is, uh, um, to put it very brutally, it's a globalization today I feel is another name for Americanization. And so a long time ago, it was the social scientist uh, Ritzel who said, who wrote a book on it and gave it the very suitable title of McDonaldization of society. So now it's no longer something new. It's something that we all take for granted, but its impact on our life and on our culture is something that's phenomenal. And now when I look at a woman, 
I immediately say to myself, if she is sari wearing, and you know, a particular profile, then she has to be 30 above plus. If she, if she is wearing a pants and tops and you know, western clothes, then it is under. So what does it mean? It means that somewhere this whole uh, globalization is impacting our culture, our ways of living life, our buying patterns, our food habits. The way we, from an Adda culture, now we have gone to taking the rest and we carry a mug of coffee in our hand as we move around the Child. famous Child. Uh, yeah, to Starbucks wala concept here, pakro coffee and walk on the streets and you know. So there are many, many issues here which uh, require a, a, a sort of a deeper and closer analysis. And among them, while we were just coming in, Jwada and, and we were just chatting, and he remarked about how when he joined the service, it was in the era of the socialist republics of, or Republic of India. Today, it is the United States of India. <laughs> so it is a very different uh, subcontinent that we are looking at. And uh, if you go back to somebody like the Austrian economist, who said very famously that capitalism is the death of creativity. So many of us, as the capitalist model is being adopted everywhere, it's not that we are in a position to do anything about it. We will always remain a minority. But I do lament the loss of the creativity that is implicit in my loss of culture. So now, if I may begin with Ambassador Mansi, uh, for his views on this subject. I am uh, grateful to Dipai Mozunda who is not here and thankful to Sataji for inviting me to join this very distinguished panel and as I can see, a very distinguished audience. <coughs> now, uh, Judging by Shankarji's opening remarks, I feel it may be a long ideological evening. Uh, but uh, let's let's look at the issues without with an open mind. Uh, first, with a confession, I am no specialist on cultural identity. I think you have a, a very distinguished academic, Professor Amrit Srinivasan here, and you have, of course, uh, the Tsar. The Sarkar of Culture uh, is sitting here with us. I'm sure they will throw a lot of light on, on this subject. But uh, I will base my remarks on my own experiences. As, as somebody who comes from a very richly cultural state like Odisha, and my experience of more than 40 years in the diplomatic service. So during my service, the issue of local versus global was never very far away. Uh, when I joined the Foreign Service way back in 1963, I felt I was almost 100% local. You have to grow up in Odisha to understand how strong the Odia cultural identity is and how, uh, uh, how great the sense of cultural exceptionalism is in that state. Odisha may be one of the poorest states in India, but every Odia believes that in terms of uh, its rich heritage and cultural excellence, Odisha is second to none. Uh, so pride in one's local culture is essentially a part of the <coughs> Indian identity. Uh, I recall how I used to bristle with uh, annoyance when somebody assumed that I was from Bihar or UP or Rajasthan. <laughs> Or when well-meaning Bengali friends would say, oh yes, Odisha, uh, it has the same culture as Bengal. <laughs> uh, no, I used to assert, we don't have the same culture, we are different, we are better, we are superior. <laughs> so let's, let's try and figure out how this issue of cultural identity has actually impacted and what is the true nature of identity. First, let's define what we are talking about. Civilization and culture are related concepts 
And they both refer to a common pattern of behavior based on beliefs, norms, and values. So within a larger area of culture, as in India, there are numerous subcultures which can be regional or even sub-regional and local. Now when you come to identity, it's a slightly different concept because identity is an individual sense of his or her culture or civilization. It's a kind of internalization of what you perceive your culture or civilization to be. So when Punjabis or Bengalis or South Indians feel they are different and in most cases superior, they are actually asserting the individual cultural identity. So that is what it looks like. But my contention is, this is only superficial. We are superficially parochial in our culture. Actually, we are not. Dig deeper into our, our history and uh, the nature of our civilization, and you'll find that we have always been not local, not regional. We've actually been global. We have been global. In fact, our ancestors went a step further. Their outlook was actually cosmic at a time when scientists had not discovered the contours of the universe. Our ancestors, from Vedic time onwards, had an imagination of the cosmos which turned out to be true. So what is the Indian cultural identity? I think the cultural identity which evolved through several thousand years of evolution is amazingly complex. There are two broad qualities, in my view, which define the Indian cultural identity. One is, it is pluralistic and inclusive, and secondly, it is universal and global. Let me explain. In most societies, people claim their identity at several levels. It is individual, a group, like in the concept of a clan or a tribe or a caste. Uh, it can be regional, it can be national. And in the 21st century, a new element has been added, which is uh, the global, and therefore, as Shantaji rightly said, globalization is uh, a phenomenon of our times and it needs an effort to understand what it means for our cultural identity. Now, uh, all the four or five different layers exist in Indian society. The only difference, in my view, is that in other civilizations, they claim that they have exclusive uh, rights to a particular kind of culture which others don't share. Um, in India, my, my perception is that while efforts have been made to project ourselves as a very exclusive civilization, actually we have not been exclusive. We have been pretty open and inclusive. The three more common, uh, most common assertions of being an exclusive culture our ethnicity, language, and cuisine. So let us examine if, as Indians, we can claim exclusivity in any of these fields. Let's start with ethnicity. Um, the extensive use of the word Aryan, the concept of Varnashram, has given the impression that we are people with, uh, who are descended from a pure Aryan race in the past, or as the South Indians say, they are derived from a pure Dravidian race. I think this has now been exploded as a myth. There is no such thing as an Aryan race or a Dravidian race. Modern scientific discovery has made it clear there is no ethnic purity so far as the Indian population is concerned. In fact, Dr. Niharanjan Rai in his works has projected that the only true pure ethnic group that exists in India, they are the Adivasis, the original inhabitants of our country. All the rest of us are migrants from some part of the world or other. So we have strong links with the regions around us, and therefore we have common ethnic links with them. My good friend Mohan Guruswami recently circulated a paper, which I found was very intriguing. He has uh, concluded that many of the identified groups, at least in North India, have Central Asian links, and this is where uh, I, I can't verify his, the authenticity of his scholarship, but it is an intriguing thinking. Uh, his paper was entitled, Who Are We? And he says, we have come from different parts of the world. 
The Sisodias for Rajasthan, for instance, he says, are Sasanians. Um, the Jats are actually from a group called the Gatei in Central Asia. The Gujars have come from the Khazars of Central Asia. And the Thakurs are Tukarians. Believe it or not. I, I, I don't know whether it's right or wrong, but it sounds very interesting. Let's look at language. Do we have a pure language that nobody else has? Well, unlike the ancient languages, let's say of the Chinese or the Egyptians or the people who created the Mesopotamian Potamian civilization, Indian languages have family roots with a lot of other languages in the world. Sanskrit had common roots with the Avestan of Persia, with Latin and Greek. Uh, the Dravidian languages have also been discovered in other parts of the world. There is a group called the Brahvis of Baluchistan who speak a pure Dravidian language. So that shows that even our language is not ethnic and not local. What about cuisine? Of course, there can't be any other country which shares our cuisine. Indian cuisine, of course, is exclusive. But here's the surprise. 75% or more of the food stuff we use today uh, didn't exist before the colonial powers came to India. <laughs> A good index is to check if you go to Puri and go to the Jagannath temple and you have what is called the Mahaprasad, the food that they cook there and serve to thousands of pilgrims every day. You'll find that there's a long list of banned vegetables because they came during the colonial period. So tomato, potato, cabbage, cauliflower, you name it, they're not there. So what we take it for granted today is part of our cuisine actually came from somewhere else. You know that when I was younger and more ignorant, I got into a heated discussion with a lady ambassador from Mexico <laughs> who asserted that the chili originated in Mexico. I said, it can't be. <laughs> this is the homeland of the chili. Where else can you find uh, food that uses chili so extensively? Now I know that she was right and I was wrong. The chili actually came from Latin America it was brought by the Portuguese to Sri Lanka first, and then from Sri Lanka it moved upwards into India. And I found proof of that because if you go back to Orissa, the word chili is called a Lanka. So there you are. Now, um, one of the things we love most are jalebis, samosas, parfis, they all came from the Middle East. Right? So, uh, I think the great quality of Indian civilization is we adapted, we accepted, made it our own, and it became unique. And then we shared it, we synthesized foreign influences, and we made it uniquely uh, an Indian product. The result has been that all Indians, I assert, are multicultural personalities. They have multicultural identities. Let me give you an example of two of our greatest cultural icons, removed in time by nearly 500 years. <coughs> the first, Amir Khusru, Turkish by origin, <laughs> Persian by training, and unmistakably Indian at heart. He uh, was equally at home in Persian and in British Persian. He was the one who is said to have been introduced the Khayal, he's supposed to have invented the sitar, brought in the, the tabla into Indian music, great symbol of multicultural uh, identity of India. The fast forward to the 20th century, and you have somebody very similar in Gurudev Ravindranath Tagore. Tagore claimed that he was, he represented the confluence of three cultures, Hindu, Mohammedan, and British. So there you are. The point I've tried to make so far is that it's been leading to see Indian culture in terms of disparate, mutually exclusive elements. There is no either or in our culture. Everything is acceptable. <laughs> we, these elements do not clash, they blend with each other and they become a beautiful composite culture. Now let's come to the issue that uh, Shantaji had raised, globalization. 
a threat to Indian culture, question mark. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to differ with Santaji and maybe with the other panelists here. Now, there is of course a raging debate uh, about amongst the world's intellectuals on the impact of globalization. Uh, two very good friends of mine who are known international scholars, uh, Ambassador Haide of Chile and Professor Ramesh Thakur of Australia have written a book recently called The Dark Side of Globalization. The authors conclude, and Shantaji would of course readily agree with them, that um, globalization has a dark side. Uh, they have concluded that economic globalization has led to an unleashing of what they call negative forces. They think this has led to what they call uncivil society. This has led to uh, arms trade in Western Africa, to organized crime in South Africa, <laughs> and closer home, they think that it has created a Naxal movement in India and has also influenced the Maoist movement in Nepal. In India, there are many critics of globalization. They come from the religious right as well from the secular left. Both conclude that the seductive materialism of the West, as Shantaji did point out, has produced a new generation of hedonists who are devoid of spiritual values, who are abandoning their traditional culture in preference to the bright imitation of the West. And this is spelling the demise of Indian culture. And of course, they predict that what we are seeing is the beginning of the end of all that is precious in our heritage, in our dance, music, and our social customs. Well, with due respect to these prophets of gloom and doom, uh, let me assert that they are wrong. <laughs> uh, there is no empirical evidence to suggest that there has been a serious erosion of values in India and as a result of globalization. In fact, I believe that the composite, pluralistic, inclusive, secular culture has immunized us from any kind of evil effect <laughs> of any global influence. The debate was settled many centuries ago uh, when our intellectual ancestors concluded, I am Rijal Paro Bedi Ganana Labu Chindasa Udara Chalita Nam to Vasudhaiva Kutumbaka. What does it say? This is mine, that is yours, that is the product of inferior minds. For those who have a broad intellect, the entire world is a pattern. That is what Indian culture represents. That is who we are. Throughout our history, we have welcomed foreigners and their culture. They essentially became a part of the Indian mosaic. We have been equally active in reaching out to other parts of the world. And we never went out as colonizers, as, as, as uh, conquerors, but as traders, as preachers, as cultural ambassadors. Indians have never been afraid of globalization because they were the original globalizers. They exported the language, the literature, the music, and the spirituality to different parts of the world with open arms. So let me <coughs> assert that I do not believe that globalization, economic globalization, is a threat to our culture. And this, in fact, was what I think the great poet Tagore talked about in a favorite poem of mine, which is called Bharat Tirtha, in which only Tagore could describe the Indian spirit, as he called it, the music of many hearts mingling in a single harmony. And then he said, writes in this poem, the Aryan, the non-Aryan, the Dravidian, the Hun, the Pathan, and the Mughals, they have merged here into one body. All are welcome to the shores of Bharat. Hey Manupair, hey Bharatpair, Mahamanupair, Shagavdiri. So in my four decades of experience as a diplomat, I have witnessed that Indian culture has gone to every nook and corner of the world. I have seen Chinese, Japanese, Russian, French, and American girls dancing Bharatanatyam, Urissi, and Kathak. In remote Nigeria, 
I stumbled upon a temple, which was a Jagannath temple, with, complete with the idol of Lord Jagannath, and all the rituals are conducted by Nigerian priests who are wearing the sacred thread and wearing the gamchas and dhotis. Uh, there, Lord Jagannath is there in Nigeria. Um, Indian movies have become the vehicle of the global entertainment. They have long overtaken Bollywood and the major producers of films in the world. In fact, Bollywood is now coming. Hollywood is now approaching Bollywood and trying to figure out how to have an alliance. <laughs> they, they, they worked out a, a kind of alliance in a film called Slumdog Millionaire. Slumdog Millionaire, talking about the, the slums of, of India in Bombay, uh, it won eight Oscars, and that's a, a Hollywood production. Therefore, let me conclude by saying, let us abandon this paranoia about, uh, about uh, globalization. Because we are not the victims of globalizations. We have always been the globalizations. In fact, I would assert, we created globalization. We invented globalization. Our ladies love to wear tanjoi saris. It came from China. <laughs> Silk came from China. We love to eat biryani, kebab, samosas, jalebis, halwas, barfis. They came from the Middle East. So, what we worried about, as Raj Kapoor said in that famous song of his, Mera Juta hai Japani, everything about me is from somewhere else. But what is important? Mera Dil hai Hindustan. That is what is important. <laughs> so, what ultimately matters is, let us relax. India is not afraid of globalization, because India is globalizing the world. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Man Singh never ceases to surprise me. I'm glad I provoked him. I'm glad that he came up with uh, a lot of uh, very interesting observations. My only correction is I never said that the young are not spiritual. No. I don't believe that. I think in fact there is a wave in the, the youth of today and the apparel is of course a very um, um, surface um, sign of their existence. Uh, you, you don't have to be judged about your spirituality from what you wear. It was just an observation in the sense that these are the, the, the markers of a certain kind of local versus global debate. And of course, I had this in my Vasudeva Kutumbukam, of course, these are the very, very important uh, truths at the heart of our culture. But the cultural identity today is definitely going through a melting pot and definitely the jury is out in terms of uh, whether the Dil Hai Japani or the Dil Hai Hindustani, you know, is it aware of that Hindustan? Is it aware of that whole uh, culture, I think somewhere it needs to reconnect with that culture which has made it possible for uh, today's India to, to harmonize. I, I do believe that at the end of the day, whether as we saw in the recent elections, did you see the, the debate yesterday with Hillary in any, you were in it. <laughs> so for no, 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 no. basically it was that debate on uh, Pakistan on this yeah. not uh, coming out fast enough to agree to the invitation. Yeah, so the debate, yes. yes, you were there, of course. And in that, that gentleman is so entertaining, Eleni from Pakistan. 
I think Times now invites him because it just gives him free entertainment value. Because he <laughs> sat there and he went on saying, this man is a butcher, this man yeah, is yeah. a murderer. <laughs> and the others are trying to say, hey, now you're talking about our Prime Minister, please. <laughs> you can't say that. He's not letting you keep quiet. He's going on with what he had to say. So somewhere, you know, there is that heart resonating as one, which has enabled this particular phenomena. There are the dissenters, of course there will be, and we are happy that they are there, we want to have more of them. I thought to myself, now that this has happened and if there is an election in Delhi, oh, I'll have no choice except to vote for out. Which is a party that I think is immature and, you know, uh, as non-starter, but I'll have to do it because I want to encourage uh, opposition. So anyway, Forgive me for this long interjection. Forgive me, forgive me. Uh, uh, I will leave our expert here to the last and I'll go to uh, Jawar Sarkar for his views. And you can speak from where you are if you so wish. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Jefferson. Uh, always a problem. You have to succeed, or even attempt to succeed, Ambassador Man Singh. <laughs> <laughs> I just want my entire preparation is not a folder. I'll show you what I have read. <laughs> so, so I got scared when he started speaking with so much erudition that I had to turn it into some paper and wrote whatever comes to me. But let me start by saying that uh, he's one of the senior civil servants, if I may use a generic term, for whom I have a very deep respect. Not only because he has had a more successful career than mine, he was more tactful than you could be that. <laughs> but also because he could bottle up, absorb so much erudition and not flaunt it, could continue to be able to have an open mind. So let me start by taking a couple of cues from where he started. Uh, he started with Odisha, the state I love. And I love it for different reasons, and one of them is how it stood up to a tyrant, cultural tyrant called Bengal. <laughs> you have to understand what tyranny is until you actually suffer it. it uh, Madam, you need not nod your head because your state was equally culturally aggressive. <laughs> 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 Oh, you're from Odisha. She has a split identity, now she's identified with Odisha. So had it not been for the strength of a 3,000 year old culture, they would have been swamped by these yesterday Bengalis who happened to chance upon a fortune because the British decided to land on a malarial swamp and make use of user-friendly Bengalis. So we'll go up on all the traditions of culture that come in here in hitherto add up to a bombastic high level and had it not been for the strength of, as I said, a long sustained culture, they would have been directized by Bengal and it not been for Zerapati, Nirmohan and others. Every attempt was made. Now coming back to this one, I am reminded of my issues, most, problem, most people have issues either with spouse or with children. <laughs> I am no exception, I have it both. <laughs> both have it me. So my problem with thinking child is, of course he'll remain a child, uh, is that you get it back in a globalized world. So when I asked him to describe with some degree of clarity what he was up to, he scratched his uncan beard and said, right, clarity? Clarity is something that comes to lesser minds. <laughs> so under this excuse, I shall zigzag my argument to the extent that is only possible without giving any clarity. I shall start by referring to the first degree of reported globalization in India. Because we are now talking of India. But before that, let me voice my concerns may sound a little parochial, at the distress that most civilized people of the world suffer now of being swamped by, by a tsunami of a very standardized artificial culture of commercialism and consumerism. There is a doubt. 
there is a fear. But the same fear existed when Rome got up. It existed when mighty empires get up and flex their muscles, export their brand of non-culture and have it shoved down the throats of subordinate people. It happens, it has happened in the past, residues stay and sometimes they go. They learn, they change. I can give an example since I raised Rome as an example.